I was been walking through the Psalms uh, as as uh, as carefully as we possibly can, uh, to, so as not to um, to hurry, but also just trying to make our way through. And <clears throat> I do want to point out that I did I titled it "To Judge or Not to Judge," and uh, this could potentially be uh, somewhat um, controversial for people. How many of you have ever heard someone say, well, judge not? Have you ever heard somebody say that? Okay, judge not. <laughs> so we know um, the important thing is in this, and I'm just going to say all this kind of in a, in a preliminary kind of setting it up a way. Context is always important. And uh, Jesus himself said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So in the same, almost the same verse, he makes that statement, judge not, but judge. So the answer really is, and I, I hopefully throughout this, we can establish really what that looks like. And, and mainly because the way this psalm starts off, it's, it's, he is diagnosing, if you would. And we'll call that discernment. Now, the Lord hit me upside the head this morning, guys. Sorry, but you know, the ladies got a Mother's Day thing and guys didn't really. But this actually, uh, as I'm looking at it, these you can find attributes of a godly father uh, right in this. And, and just so you know, you'll need discernment. Now, we all need discernment, don't we? Uh, you're going to need mercy. Aren't you glad your dad had mercy on you? <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Remember, I brought you into this world, bring you out. You know, okay. <laughs> we need faithfulness, got attributes of a godly father, judgment, uh, righteousness, loving kindness. Uh, these are all things that we're going to look at in the scripture. Um, discernment, uh, mercy, faithfulness, judgment, righteousness, loving kindness. So there is sort of a Father's Day theme in here in far, as far as um, you know, what angle you want to take. But I think that it's important for us to recognize that um, as the, as the, the, the um, title proclaims, to judge or not to judge, that we, we need to understand properly what that means, uh, especially probably as, as it relates to how we um, say the word judge today. And so... Uh, let's just read the first four verses. You'll see what I mean, maybe, and then we'll pray. Um, the, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. He flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. And so... Uh, we'll take some time to dissect as we uh, always do, but I pray, let's, uh, let's take some time to pray that God helps us through this this morning. Father, uh, we come before you as a church, Lord, as um, a group of people needing to hear from you. And uh, Lord, while I have the opportunity, awesome opportunity to really present um, how uh, this chapter flows, um, I need to hear from you. And Lord, we all need to uh, walk away from this, this psalm um, with something that we can take and apply in our hearts and lives and really in a better way, more, uh, more, more real way, honor you, glorify you, magnify you in everything that we do. So I pray you'd help us, Lord, to get a better grasp of what you're trying to teach us in this psalm today uh, by the teaching of the Word of God. And then I pray specifically for the Burton family and Olivia, Lord, and the concern that's there right now is uh, just, uh, just really... Uh, unsettling the responses and and uh, just so uh, 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 very very nerve wracking I know for the family right now so I pray for them give those doctors uh, wisdom as they um, maybe have a more specialized approach and be able to tell uh, for sure if there's anything major going on that that they're missing I would help them to see it I pray and just just please uh, um, bring recovery in, in that little girl's life. And we thank you for being a God that we can come to and, and, and really extend uh, others uh, on, on their behalf. And so we love you and we pray you'd help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
So again, I, I, I want to point out that it is important for us to understand what context means. When Jesus said, uh, in, in, in most of the time, people will run to uh, ju- uh, Matthew chapter 7, and uh, Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. And, and uh, so, so, so for, for context sake, let's understand when that is being said by Jesus, um, he is, we know this, he is the judge. Right? Judge is the, he's the, he passes down the verdict. Uh, he gives the sentence. He brings the condemnation, right? Uh, and so we, we understand that, that ultimately um, he is the judge. And, and even in, this own, in, in our uh, journey through Psalms, David has uh, multiple times, even last week, you probably remember, judge me, O God. Okay, he's, he's saying, God, please judge me. I want you to pass the verdict down on me. You know me better than I know me. You know me better than my heart knows me. And sometimes we think that we, we've got ourselves figured out, right? You don't know me, uh, uh, but God does. And David was really, truly, uh, in, uh, over and over again, through, that's a good position, a good posture for us to take. God, you judge me. Okay, now, uh, when it comes to that, absolutely, judge not. We do not have the right to pass the verdict down on somebody that does not belong to you or I. There is no, now I know in, 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 in the court of law, we've put people on a judge. A bench and, and things of that nature. I get that part. But ultimately and, and, and overwhelmingly, we do not have the right to say unequivocally what's, you know, what's the end, what's the end, or pass condemnation on other people. And the reason for that was Jesus, as he pr- proceeded to go, because you and I got to deal with first. Remember the whole moat and the bean analogy that he brought in, okay? He says, listen, you're making a big deal about a little splinter off of the beam that's sticking out of your eye. Like you see a splinter and the problem is like the splinter's off of your problem. You know, but, but all we see is the problem. <laughs> you know, you've got a much bigger problem. That's, that's basically what Jesus is telling us. When you, under, when you hear the word judge not or the two words judge not, um, we know to land at I can't pass the verdict. I can't pass the condemnation. I don't have that right. That belongs to God and God alone. Okay? But then Jesus seemingly, seemingly, and I say, I emphasize the seemingly, contradicts himself in one verse when he says, judge not. And everybody's like, yes, judge not. <laughs> right? That's where we stop. Judge not, for, for, for reference sake, if you're writing it down, John 27, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So that'd be similar to me watching a person walk down the road, looking suspicious, and knowing that somebody had just broken into somebody's house. So that guy's it. You know, and I just know he's up to no good because he wears, he's dressed the part, he looks the part, and he's, he was carrying a crowbar. Now, as suspicious as that may be, okay, is that actually going to pass in the court of law? No. Why? That's just the appearance. And how many times do we, as God's people, really, just in, as people, uh, pass the judgment upon someone based upon the appearance? Even the, even the, 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 the great uh, uh, man Samuel. Remember the prophet Samuel? Or, uh, 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 does he call a prophet? I forget. Uh, Samuel, uh, in the scripture, uh, he, when he laid eyes on, 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 on all of David's brothers, he just knew, man, no, this is it. This is this. this these, these guys. When he saw David, it was like, really? <laughs> him? <laughs> like, this guy? I mean, are you sure? This guy? And what was God's words to him? Listen, man sees on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And ultimately, when Jesus was telling these people in his teaching in John chapter 7, he was saying, hey, guys, listen, you want all the evidence to come in. Now, he was talking to them because they weren't accepting him as Jesus. 
So we can, if we're talking about context, we have to understand they were not accepting him as Jesus. And I know we haven't gotten really to Psalms yet. I'm trying to set this up. So just bear with me a minute, okay? I'm trying to help us because we do get a lot of pushback on this. Judge not, judge not, judge not, or, or judge, you know, whatever. We, we need to know what the context is, right? And that's the important thing about this. But Jesus, in, in his uh, address to the people in John chapter 7, they were pushing back on him because they thought Jesus was going to Messiah was going to come from a certain place and he was going to set up them and, and all that. But they were missing everything that Jesus brought to the table. Literally everything. His word, his works, the, the, the blessing of the Father. And God is like, I've brought all the evidence. It's right here. And all you're doing is you're just looking with your own little physical eyes and you're not seeing it. Are you with me? And how many times do we miss it? Because we don't allow the evidence to come out. We pass judgment on somebody because of the way they walked in the church. Well, they must be mad at me. Well, good night. I'm not going to talk to them. Okay. okay. Now, as silly as that is, right, as silly as that is, we do that same thing to people and churches get fractured and people walk out of churches and they never come back or, or whatever because it's an appearance. And God is saying, no, 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 no. We've got to get, there's a principle at play here. We have to get the evidence. Okay. So here we are, Psalm 36. There's evidence that's being project, pro, pro, projected here. The evidence of the wicked in heart. It's kind of heavy. Uh, it, it, it's really something that you want to avoid. Okay? And I believe that's probably part of the reason why David only spends about four verses on it. <laughs> but as it relates to fathers, it's our job, our duty, our goal in life to make sure that we do everything we can to protect our people, our children and our families from this. But what's that going to take? Discernment. And that's really what's going on. The verse 1, the transgression of the wicked. Oh, oh by the way, I did want to point this out. I wanted to point out in, this, in the title, often throughout the Psalms, there's a title. Okay, And uh, this one particularly says to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, watch this. The servant of the Lord. And the only reason I think that's so unique is that uh, we've seen that already. We studied the book of James. James started off, you know, if you follow his heritage, he is literally the, the half-brother of Jesus. So half-brother meaning he was the Mary. Uh, and so James was the half-brother. He could have he could have honestly said, Hey, I I am the half-brother of Jesus. You should listen to me. You know, No, he didn't. He, he wrote it as, hey, I'm the servant of the Lord. Moses did the same thing in, in Deuteronomy. Moses, the servant of the Lord. Joshua, the servant of the Lord. David, the servant of the Lord. The apostle Paul and Titus, the servant of the Lord. At the end of the day, isn't that where we want to land? Amen. We want to land at being a servant of the Lord. Yeah, you can call me whatever you want. Call me dad. Call me pops. You know, call me father, call me pa, I don't know, daddy, okay? Whatever you want to call me, I want to be the servant of the Lord. Amen. Right? And that should be where we all land. I just want to be the servant of the Lord. And David, so, so I, I almost got past it before I pointed that out, so don't bear with me. Verse 1, he says, The transgression of the wicked saith that within my heart there is no fear of God before their eyes. So God reveals to us that the wicked belong to a class of people, really the foolish, that, that really do not fear God. Now, this is not the reverence that we say when we say fear God. You know, the, the duty of fear God, keep his commandment, right? The, the totally different thing. This, because a wicked person, they're, they're unregenerate. They're not saved. So they can just do wrong without no fear of the consequence. And you see them over and over and over and over again in society. They're get, their voice is getting louder and louder and louder with social media and, and news media and all that. It's louder and louder and louder. There's, there's literally no fear. God could bring down the hammer. He's a gracious God. He's very long-suffering and gentle and kind and merciful and He wants us to, to repent and turn towards Him. 
so he doesn't, but, 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 but there's literally no fear of God. That's what that means. You and I have a fear, a reverence. We know who he is. We should. <laughs> uh, if you're sitting here today and you have no fear, alarm, uh, dread of the judgment of God in your life, um, I would be a little bit nervous. Because that's, that's, the, that's literally the, 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 that is the description of the wicked that's being portrayed here for David. Now, again, this is God giving that revelation to him. It's important for us to keep in mind. Because he's not bringing the verdict. David's not bringing the verdict. God is revealing this to him. That's why he said, within my heart. Okay? Now, if you look at the way the Hebrew wording is, it, and it all plays out here. Um, it's, it's like the oracles of the heart. In other words, this is something that was, that was portrayed by God to, this, to, the, to David. So where are you and I going to make the proper judgment call as dads or proper judgment call as moms or proper judgment call, proper judgment call by God alone? We, we're not going to make that on our own. That's where the judge not comes in. Are you with me? That's where we start judging according to appearance. That's where we all of a sudden just make, make assumptions for people that can and will hurt people. That's, that's how churches fracture and hurt other people. And, 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 and people walk away thinking, well, they're just full of a bunch of hypocrites. And by the way, we are hypocrites. Just so you know. If you came in here looking for no hypocrites, then sorry to disappoint you. I did not look this way when I got up this morning. Uh, but anyways, we're all hypocrites. Why? Because there's something. I get it. I get it. I get it. You know, you're preaching this and you're preaching that and you're not living this and you're not living that. At some point, there's a disconnect and then we're recognizing that we're all failing forward in this thing we call the Christian life. And we just need the grace of God to help us through. Now, listen. If you want to be the one to cast the verdict, you're doing it unbiblically. But if you're God to shine light and give, then you'll know, okay, this is how I can approach that individual. This is how I approach that group of individuals. Or don't. This is how I separate myself from the, that individual. Or this is how I separate myself from that group of individuals. And by the way, that is biblical. We don't always lovingly embrace them and bring them into our, 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 our circle. But we can certainly show the love of Christ by just being full of grace and truth. And, and so, <laughs> again, this is, this is from God. Okay? The discernment is from God. And I, I hearken you back to, to, uh, to James 1 again where he says, If you lack wisdom, ask of God. Ask Him all. If you're having a hard time discerning this, just ask God to help you. We don't start there. We always start with what we see, and that's where we go wrong, and that's where we hurt people. Verse number two, he flattereth himself in his own eyes. Now, this, this should help us, okay? This should also help us get the discernment that we need from God to make the judgment call, so to speak. Again, we're not casting the verdict. We're just making a judgment call. He flattered himself in his own eyes until his iniquity found to be hateful. So as a result of the fact that he does not res respect God, that there is no fear or dread, no alarm of God in his heart and his life, there should be in us, listen, there be each and every one of us as believers especially, a, a reverence that when we step in it wrong, we, we transgress so sorry. And we may not get things right horizontally right away. It's even worse sometimes, but hey, there could be a, a vertical, God, I'm sorry, which eventually will help fix this. You have to understand that a lot of times this, not just this, it's this as well. Now that's hard because to face the, the hurt, the amount of hurt that I've poured into someone's life, that's heavy. But th this one here now has, he's walked so much in that hurt, in that, that I don't care what God says, 
I don't, I don't care how he looks at me. I can do whatever I want. I can be my own man. I can be my own lady. Yeah, sure. But <laughs> flattery now. Flatter yourself into thinking that all is well. All is well. To the point that people are actually hurt by their callousness. And, 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 and there is, there is, I don't really know any individuals like this. I know they're out there. But, but and you probably interact with them maybe at work. So defiant in doing wrong. Just, just blatantly doing wrong. You know, well, hey, man, aren't you, don't, aren't you concerned that you're going to put them out of a job? Who cares? To the hurt of someone else. And this can show up in many different ways, but this is a, a, again, God is giving us the discernment to recognize this in that person. There's so much flattery. Ah, I'm, I'm good. I don't need God. I can do this. I can worship God on my own. I can go here and I can say this. I can do this without... There's just that's flattery. Verse number three, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. This now is speech, right? So we see that there's, there's no fear in their heart. Now in his own eyes, he's good, okay? Now in his speech, just everything he projects on people or she projects on people is just emptiness, Really, that, that word iniquity is just nothingness or, or to the point of idolatry. That their, their world is the only world that matters. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a dangerous place to be. Listen, look here first. Make sure you're not that guy. Make sure you're not that girl. That's, that's, that's hurting someone else by your own just blatant defiance of God. Now, I don't think we have that problem here. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be in church today. But is there an area in your life where you've so let, left, left out to be, you know, left off God, or you've turned your back, or you've, you've silenced God so hard to where you have turned your back in, on others? You are flattering yourself to thinking you're okay? No, allow God to speak that into you. So with his mouth, he's left. And then the, the, the tail end of that verse, left off to be wise and to do good. He's like literally just like, eh, I don't even care to do good. Like I'm like intentionally doing wrong. And really the definition, overwhelming definition of wickedness in Scripture is someone who does wrong without any desire of repentance. Just actively pursuing wrong. You know, that, that's not... That is not the, the label of a Christian. When a true Christian, a true believer is wrong, there is a conviction, there is a weight, there is a desire to get that right. And there's a pull on that. And, and you can silence the Holy Spirit for so long, but eventually the chastening hand of God will come down and He will reprove you in that. And how that looks, I don't know, but He lovingly does it to help us out. Because he doesn't want you to hurt your life or hurt anybody else. To the point, in James, to the point of death sometimes. Where he will just take you out because you're hurting too many people. Now don't let that be you. <laughs> if you're, if you're in, at some point in this and the Holy Spirit has been drawing you and try, trying to get you back into his loving grace, yield to that. Repent. Get it right. And yield. Just, just come back into his loving arms. But, but again, we're, we're, we're recognizing in others there's, the, the, there's no fear of God in his heart. He flatters himself. He's, 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 his speech is hateful or full of emptiness and, 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 and idolatry. Left off to be wise. He doesn't even care about uh, doing the right thing. And then in verse number four, like to the point that he's devising those same type of things in his, on his bed. You ever had those moments where your mind just doesn't rest? You know, I, I, I always heard pastors growing up like talking about how like I think about the church people. I think about that actually happens. It's kind of scary. I'm a pastor and it happens to me. I think about you guys and I, the, the different problems that you're facing or maybe not. Maybe just thinking God brings like thinking about that and how like, oh, God, please be with them. And I, I understand Dan's got this 
incredible work situation that he's dealing with right now. And in my mind, that it, wor it works in that way. The wicked people, they're like, oh, man, how can I do that again? I'm get away with it. I'm just gonna do that. You know, they're literally devising this in their mind. It's a plot in their mind to just do emptiness and nothingness and, and hurtful things. I know we can't right, quite wrap our minds around that, but that really truly is a thing. And so David is, God is giving David a glimpse into the discernment of this is what that looks like. So that's why I say to judge, right? Or not to judge. The answer is we have no right to pass the verdict. We are not sitting on the judge's bench. It's ultimately God. He's always had that spot and he always will. We can't take that away from him. So when it comes to passing the verdict on another brother or sister or friend, listen, it is God. But we can also have discernment in knowing, yeah, I don't want to do that. God can reveal this in our hearts and our lives that I don't need to interact with that person. I don't need to go to that place with them. I don't need to watch that show because they're showing this. Huh? God will give you that. So, in, a, in verse number, towards at the end of verse number four, he abhorreth not evil. See, these are not marks of a Christian. See, we are, remember, as, as Christians, we are supposed that abhorring evil is really just that it's distasteful. It's, there's there's this, this hatred for it. Like we, we just want to, to, to get away from it. And there's just none of that in this person's life. So we need that discernment, don't we? So this pictures the wickedness of the human heart. This helps us to see sin as the Lord sees sin. Okay, God sees sin as, well, there's just no fear of God there. There's no fear or dread of me. There's, there's, just, there's just wickedness there. There's, that's in all of us, by the way. It's, it's in each and every one of us. Now, by the grace of God, Him moving into our hearts and the Holy Spirit working in us, those things should have less of a place in our world, if any. And, 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 and we should be ever becoming drawing closer to Jesus, right? In the grace of God. And that's what we're about to start to focus on. And I love how He just like changes gears in verse 5. In verse number 5, He's like, Thy mercy, O Lord. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. The, this, the word for mercy is like that, or uh, uh, faithfulness is steadfast. It's unfailing. Uh, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. It just reaches way up there. You think about how if you went up there right now and tried to put a measuring tape on the heavens, Oh, we've never been able to do it. They've tried. They call it light years, and that's even based on some, some flawed system they call evolution, thinking that the world is some millions of years old, right? So a star has to be this many thousand year, light years away. And, and it's based on some flawed measurement measuring system that they call evolution. But regardless, we've not been able to measure this universe. God did it. <laughs> The Bible says he measured it in the span of his hand. That's pretty good right there. He's a big God, isn't he? But his mercies reach that. And you think about the amount of coverage that is. Every person living and breathing right now is covered by the mercies of God. <laughs> you know what? That right there ought to get you to shouting and, and, and make you feel excited to worship the Lord. Why? His mercy person we we're just talking about that wicked person that doesn't even think about god his mercy covers him too they, they don't even they're plotting wickedness and and, and, and and idolatry and emptiness and they're just trying to hurt hurt people uh, hey his mercy covers them too you and i can't wrap our minds around that so we you know we're, we're we're like reciprocal givers here you give me mercy i give you mercy god doesn't do that way he just covers everybody that's amazing to me. And, and he deserves worship for that. He deserves praise for that. Why? Well, because that same mercy extended to you at some point, and it stole your heart away. 
And maybe someday by the grace of God, it'll steal their heart away. And they won't be hurting anybody else anymore. That's what we're after. That's what the grace of God is after. His mercy is, re is in the heavens. Thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. It's uh, it limitless and it's inexhaustible as the skies above our heads. You know, to me, it's like if you got in a plane and you just were able to keep that thing fueled up and just started flying, you'd be still flying. And you just keep flying, right? Keep flying and flying and flying and flying. I think that's why he said in Psalm, I think it's 103, uh, as far as the east is from the west, right? Just keeps going. Just keeps going. Keeps going. Why? It's limitless. Inexhaustible. His mercy. <laughs> and then he tells us that they're new every morning. So not only are they limitless and ex inexhaustible today, well, then he's just going to refresh them again if if, if, and it's a big if, you were able to somehow exhaust those mercies, you're hitting the reset button in a 24-hour period. Absolutely, praise the Lord. And we can't exhaust them, but, but, but He is going to reset that for you in the morning. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> I get a little excited about it. And uh, I just love how G David just takes his shift and shifts it. Okay, yeah, there's some nonsense going on over here. And uh, I'm going to recognize that. But God, you're pretty big. Like, you're a great God. You see how much mercy is? He just turns right where it belongs. Like, yeah, I want to recognize the, the knucklehead in the corner over here. But really, truly, God, you're great. And he keeps going. Verse number six, thy righteousness is like the great mountains. So again, uh, fathers, discernment, uh, mercy, uh, faithfulness. These are all attributes of, of good dads. And, and, and oh, oh, we may have failed up to this point. But listen, it doesn't matter what you did back. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't matter because there has been some hurt. I get that part. But that, like, we can't change that. But what we do have is this ahead of us. And, and let's be faithful now. Uh, let's be merciful now. Uh, let's, let's be discerning now. Let's make sure that we are righteous now. Let's make sure that we are exercising judgment now. Uh -huh. We can be like God now. That righteousness is like the great mountains. And, and as he looked at, at, at the mount, the, the biggest mount that he would have seen in that region. And you think about how, how powerful a mountain, uh, just the, the amount of power a mountain represents. Just soil seemingly above everybody. We measure them in, in, in thousands of feet. You know, I think the tallest mountain that we know of on this planet, some 29,000 feet above sea level. That's a lot of feet. <laughs> uh, above sea level. And, and, and it's taken special trips, days, to climb to the top of it. And we consider it such a great feat. But God's faithfulness and His mercy and His greatness, His righteousness is as great as that. Strong, powerful, and magnificent. Are you with me? Thy righteousness. Again, let me point this to you. Let me, let me remind you. When we see righteousness in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, it has to remind us. It has to remind us of the righteousness that Jesus clothes us with the moment we ask Him for, for salvation. And that, that righteousness is powerful as a mountain. And then he steps in for, for, uh, uh, and says, Thy judgment are a great deep. You know what that reminds me of? The unsearchable riches of Jesus. You know, you can't, like, you can't even, like, grasp the depth. Even John, when he finished writing his, his book in, in John 21, he said, listen, I'm, if, 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 if I wrote everything, I reckon that not even the world can contain the scrolls of his works. We have a hard enough time dissecting 66 books. I know a, a pastor that's, that walks like we do, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It took him like seven or eight years to do with his church. It might take us longer. I'm not as good as that. But, uh, <laughs> so stick with us, okay? Stay tuned. Uh, but the reality of it is, the reality, it's unsearchable. But he's going back through it again. Why? Unsearchable riches. Over and over and over again in the book of Psalms, uh, the, the word of God, the, the laws of God are referred to as judgments. Thy judgments are a great deep. And do you know what? That they've, they've, they've said that... Uh,
go in deep and they, they take special, um, it's taken years for them to come up with the technology to, to get something that can withstand the pressure of going that deep. Huh? And that is really truly how it is with even with you and I, when we get deep in the scriptures, sometimes we can't handle the pressure. That pressure that God puts on us to, hey, be more like Him and be, be ye holy for I am holy, that hurts. Sometimes we have to come back up for air. Huh? There's some pressure in that, but his, 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 his judgments are like the great deep. David is, is do, hey, he's doing it. He's doing it again, y'all. He's doing it again. Pointing to the mercies of God. If you haven't figured it out by now, there is plenty to rejoice in the Lord over. O oh Lord, he says, I love this, thou preservest man and beast. You know, he takes the time to make sure that the, even the animals are fed, huh? Like we, we, my wife and I had a chance to get away for a couple days this week. We're sitting on the porch, this place we had, and we're watching. Early morning when the dew's out, and you get to see they're getting some of that dew. They're getting seeing them fluttering around. And it's just the, the greatness of God making sure that those little birds are taken care of. Just like the little cat that's going to snatch that bird and eat it later. Oh, come on, pastor. You had to go there, okay? So, <laughs> she said it happens. The reality of it is God makes sure to take care of all the way down to the little teeny tiny, you know, creepy crawling little ant that gets and weasels its way into your house and starts eating your food. Like that has a purpose. That's great. And, and God preserves man and beast alike. He makes sure that we're all taken care of. And, and let us listen. It doesn't take too much to look at this guy to know that we're not going hungry. Okay. We got nut rolls downstairs to make sure that I'm not hungry. We've got it. We've got it good, don't we? That's because we have a great God. And, and I love that David was just like, okay, God, I'm the servant of the Lord. I want to take some time to recognize there's a bunch of nonsense that goes on in this world. Yeah, they're dumb. They're, they're <laughs> probably, he didn't use those words. That's what I would have used if I was writing it. But, <laughs> but he say, ah, they're pretty dumb. They're stupid. They, 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 they don't even recognize there's no fear of God in their hearts. They just go blatantly, callously, do, do the wrong thing. But God, you know what? Your mercy is great. Are you seeing this? Like, yeah, we can spend a lot of time and look and just really, let's focus, let's dissect. What is and there's a lot of people out there who will sit there and try to take the time to figure out what's wrong with this world. But I love how he just took like, okay, we're all right, we're done. No, God, you're good. <laughs> I love that. Are you with me? Man and beast alike. So we see his we see his mercy. We see his faithfulness. We see his righteousness. We see his judgments. Look at verse number seven. How excellent is thy loving kindness. That word excellent is, is priceless. It's invaluable. You, you can't even put a, a price tag on it. His loving kindness is like that great overwhelm. I'm going to read this with you. Uh, 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 it, how great is thy loving kindness? I wrote this down. Oh, his priceless, valuable, loving kindness is like a great overwhelming cover that provides ref refuge in a sin-sick, sin-oppressed world. I didn't finish reading that verse. That's why I was getting tripped up on that. But here's what he says. Thou how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Now, when you look this up, Okay, there's a couple different applications that can be applied here. I think they're all very relevant personally. One, if you looked at the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, okay, when they designed it, God told them to put two angels on there with their wings stretched out. And those wings represented the mercy seat that God was going to meet us on. And when they came, the, 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 the priests would come with the blood. They would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And that was the redemption of the that year. 
But you and I have the mercy seat of God, the, the wings of God that cover us. Remember uh, the story of Ruth when Ruth said, uh, 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 cover me with your, with your uh, uh, help me. Was it the garment? Something, the garment? I, I can't remember what he said, but they skirted the garment or something like that. And, and, and Boaz covered him with the, gar with the garment. It was the outer edge of his robe, if you would, and that was symbolizing security and protection. Uh, when they, uh, I think it's David that, that writes about the, the hen that, that takes the, the chicks storm and, and covers them under wings, and, and the little baby chicks are protected from the storm. And, and over and over and over again, there's, there's, there's application that can be made right here that, that, that thy loving kindness is just invaluable, God, that you're willing to do that. Your, your loving kindness is just so, so, so covering. And, so, so, and, and by the way, loving kindness can be described as reproof. Now, you and I think reproof is a bad thing. God intended it as a good thing. He loves you. And man, he sees, he saw when Andrew Kennard was walking down that road. Go ahead. And he says, hey, here's reproof. Here's reproof. Hey, come back to me. Because if you keep going down that road, then, then there's just extreme and utter destruction. And God lovingly reproved me back. And he does that to us every day. That's invaluable. That's priceless. Huh? But here's the one that I like the most. The application that I liked the most because it was like the outer edge of the garment. And my mind immediately goes to the story when Jesus was being summoned by that, that, that priest uh, and his, his daughter was on, her, on his deathbed. Remember Jairus? God, come. And so Jesus is on his way. He's walking through the village and the Bible says multitudes of people were surrounded him. Jesus is on his way and in the middle of it he stops and he says somebody touched me. <laughs> Goosebumps thinking about it because I'm thinking now hold on a minute just like the disciples. Hey, now wait a minute God. There's a million people here. What do you mean who touched me? Huh? Like what do you mean who touched me? I touched you I'm pretty sure. But no, 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 no. The Bible is very specific. This touch happened on the outer edge of his garment. And there was that lady. She wasn't even supposed to be there. She wasn't even supposed to be even close to those people. She's an outcast. Hadn't been, they hadn't been able to figure it out for 12 years. So she, was, she couldn't be a part of her family reunions. She couldn't come to fa the, the feasts. She, she had to always stay away from the temple. She was considered defiled, uh, an outcast in society. If anybody ever saw her or even came near to her, they felt like they had to go run and clean, cleanse themselves. You know, what kind of a psychological battle that lady was playing in her mind? And we feel bad when somebody says, Ugh, you know, when I have bad breath and my wife's like, honey, go brush your teeth. I'm like, oh, my whole world's coming apart. No, this lady for 12 years, 12 years, y'all. The outer edge, the wings of Jesus. Are you with me? And it healed her immediately. Woo hey. And there, they, listen, that's, that's just one instance, right? That's just one instance where Jesus, but, but so powerful is the outer edge of his. Years in your life. Do you know what? That's the grace of an almighty God. That's why his loving kindness is so overwhelmingly invaluable and priceless in our life. Because when we have things that we've been dealing with and we just can't seem to give victory over it, all it takes is just to just, just, just touch the outer edge of his garment. And it is overwhelmingly valuable for us. That's God. He loves you. And the, even this the outer edge of his gum, we just, if I could just touch that, just, just the edge, I, I, maybe, just maybe, I've tried everything. He's here today. Hey, man, I've tried everything. Try Jesus. 
His outer edge of this garment is powerful enough to wipe all that out. All of it. What a blessing. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. And there, especially, especially in here, you see the exclamation point. That's worth exclaiming, isn't it? His loving kindness is great. Therefore, the children of men put their trust in the shadow of thy wings. Verse 8, they, they, they shall abundantly, <laughs> abundantly be satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasure. Coming into God's house is a temple where we, feel, we find abundance of satisfying provision. And we can find a light as we immerse ourselves in the rivers of God's mercy and grace. By the way, you and I are considered the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? No longer is there a place, a physical place. We, we have to go and, and bring our worship. Like God, I'm moving in. I'm just bringing the Holy Spirit in. When you, when you get saved, Holy Spirit moves in here. This is the temple of God. Okay, so we bring that worship to other people as well. We come into, we call God's house now on church on Sunday. We bring that with us and we, we worship God. You've already done it here. Praise the Lord. That's good. Hey, there is some, some, some worship there. Why? Because there is abundance. You can't exhaust it. And other people should come in here on Sunday. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and receive that abundance. You know, the world is beating us up. It's just dragging us through the mud, and it's just dragging us through the nonsense that they have to offer. And, and they're demanding more and more and more from you, and yet you can never match up. You can never own up. You never reach their standard. And every time you reach it, they, they lift it even higher, and you're never good enough. And the grace of God is like, man, oh, you're not good enough? Here, let me give you mercy for that. Gee, you're not good. Here's some mercy for that. There's, an, oh, and there's more where that came from. And if you exhaust that, I've got more. There's an abundance. Oh, man. Abundantly satisfied. This is like, you know, finishing peanut butter pie on Thanksgiving Day and going back for fourths. <laughs> Uh, we call that indulgence, but the reality of it is there's more, okay? There's another pie in the oven, y'all. There's more where that came from. That's the way it should be for us, pouring into others. When someone come into contact with you and I, when they come into, into God's temple, huh? There should be more of where that came from. They should leave our presence knowing, I could go back and get more of that. This is satisfying. Why? Because God has... So overwhelmingly poured his abundance of goodness into our life. We have to pour it out. It's like we said this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. They shall be filled. Why? So that we can hold a full abundance of a, a full container and walk around. Nope, I'm full. No. So we can pour that out. God never intended for us to just hold it in and be full containers. No, he wanted us to be filled to overflowing. There should be more coming out of us. Verse number nine, for with thee is the fountain of life. That word fountain, it's the source. Uh, and I love this, it's sort of a play on words. In thy light shall we see light. Are you following that? In thy light shall we see light. See, we don't get enlightened until we interact with the light. Once you come in contact with Jesus and you truly allow Jesus to, to, to be into your world, hey, then it comes out. Now we recognize what light, true light is. We know when that's, that, 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 that false teacher is maybe speaking on the news or something like that, and he's trying to say something about this and that, and you're like, no, nah, that, that's not light. Why? Because we've interacted with Jesus. See, he's the source. Not only is he the source, he is the light. So he's the source of light and he is the light. He is all that we will ever need. That's why we say, and we'll say it again, Jesus is more than enough. You want to say that with me? Jesus is more than enough. Man, I hope you know that. He is more than enough. Because if not, if you don't know that, you're going to go back to whatever it was that you tried again 
satisfying as it was last week. That's why you're going to have to go back again and, and again and, and again and waste money and waste time and waste efforts and resources. And uh, you're going to keep going back and back and back and back. So deeper and deeper and deeper. Hey, just get lost in the good of, goodness of God. He is the and he is the light. Uh, if you want a good reference, cross reference, we don't have time to go there, but go to John 1, 4 and John 8, 12, and you will see where Jesus says, he is the water and he is the life, light. In him was light. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God, and the word was. Or, uh, for in him was life and light. Are you with me? John, I'm, I probably totally butchered that, but you go and read it and find it for yourself. But John, not only is he the source, he is. Verse 10, oh, continue thy loving kind. Now he moves into an intercessory. This is where the fathers need to, and, 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 and Christians need to really tap into this. That intercessory, God, please help my child. Help my son, help my daughter, help my wife, help myself, help me, to Lord, to just continue in that loving kindness, huh? And just pray an intercessory prayer for that to be poured down from God. This is the prayer. Oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. God, just, just pour that out. And, and God, would you pour that out of me? Would you, would you use me as a channel? Would you use me as that vessel to be that? I just want to pour that goodness, that loving kindness, uh, and that mercy out on other people. And then guarding against pride. Verse 11, let not the foot of pride come against me. Let not the hand of the wicked remove me. <laughs> you know, listen, there is an effort to knock you off your pegs. Like, it just, Satan... He's got all his little minions at work and they're just doing whatever they can to just knock you off your pegs. And you've probably felt it this week at some point. Man, how did that happen? Lying flat on your back thinking, what in the world? huh? But, but, but listen, God's mercy is here to help pick you back up and get you back on the right track. And, 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 and guarding against pride, this is... When we truly allow the mercies of God to pour in and pour out, pour in, pour out, pour in, pour out of us, listen, there's no room for pride. There's no room for us to toot our own horn and beat our own drum and, you know, pat our own selves on the back and raise our own flag. No, it's all about Jesus. We're reflecting Him more and more and more and more. Every day, every day, every hour, reflecting Him more and more and more. There's no room for pride in this. Are you with me? And then He finishes up in verse 12. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They're cast down and shall not be able to rise. See, okay, right there, right there. See, pride is what gets them. See, God, if, you, if, if pride comes in, that, that's, that's the demise right there. The, 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 uh, David's son, his own son, Solomon said, uh, pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Remember that. D David's saying that right here. Okay, God, I I if I don't guard against pride, that's, that's going to be my demise. So us taking this humble approach before an almighty God and he's pouring into us and he's just immersing us in his mercy and, and we just feel so wonderful that, that he's been so good to us. Uh, if we are not careful and if we're not completely guarded, we can come out with a sense of pride and be like, cool, did you see how good God was to me? Look at my car out there. I'm driving 24. Okay. The goodness of God wanting it is not prideful. It is just, thank you so much, Lord Jesus. Thank you. And, and when somebody comes into your presence and they failed, hey man, you're just going to pour that out. Hey, you know what? So did I. I failed too. And it may not look like that, but I'm going to tell you what, the goodness of God picked me up when I failed. And man, I want to see you picked up in this. No, don't let this happen to you. Don't, 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 don't let you. I don't want you to stay down there. We, we can't afford to lose anymore. We've got to have you with us. That's, that ought to be the culture, the love, the, the desire that pours out of us as a church. Let's just pour into people and say, hey, listen, the goodness of God is so great, so great. It's abundantly satisfying. And when you eat that pie, there's more in the fridge. 
There's another one baking in the oven. The goodness of God. Man, listen, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope you've been encouraged by this psalm today. Gentlemen, as fathers, we should be discerning. We should exercise judgment, mercy, loving kindness, righteousness, judgment, intercessory prayer for those in our midst. And God, and maybe your kids are gone and maybe they're just, they're just dead set in their But you can still pray for others and you can still pray for your kids. We're never too late. You can still intercede on their behalf. And you might say, well, my kids are just dead set in their ways and there's nothing going to change. Pray for these kids in here. Because God knows we need it. But be careful in guarding against pride. Because there is the destruction. Let's bow. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done.